Hey everybody, welcome back to our next set of notes, which is Unit 6, Aquatic and Terrestrial Pollution. In 6C, we'll be focusing on managing pollution and solid waste. This is solid waste disposal, uh, waste reduction methods, and sewage treatment. To begin with, we'll be looking at sources of MSW, which is municipal solid waste. This is all solid waste, uh, stuff we typically refer to as garbage, uh, obviously excluding any liquids or gases that need to be disposed of. That's why it's solid waste, um, sometimes referred to as solid domestic waste. Uh, ultimately, there are many sources of uh, waste, which is domestic sources, industrial, business, and agricultural sources. Uh, this is a, a draw it section here. Really what I want you to do is just look at the different types or materials of things that we throw away by percentage. So the percents are really important here to see things like paper and paperboard as about 26 percent of our total waste um, disposed of. The, the other big ones, food waste 15, yard waste 13, plastics 13, um, you know, those are all really big chunks of the amount of waste that we put in the garbage can each day. In fact, about 5.6 pounds of waste is produced per person each day. The interesting thing about this, we'll get to the end, is that this waste that has a little green arrow here, these are either recyclable, um, or sorry, these are compostable, and then things like plastic and metals and glass are recyclable. So there's a good chunk of waste that doesn't need to be disposed of in landfills um, if we process and deal with that waste differently. Uh, ultimately, how do we deal with waste? There's two main sources um, that we'll discuss here. Well, three, two main sources of disposal, but uh, four kind of different ways that we deal with it. Uh, landfilling is a primary place where our waste goes, our solid waste. And uh, after that, some good percentage of that is either recycled or incinerated. So combustion or incineration is here. And then recycling and composting. So we'll discuss all those throughout the notes here. Disposal of waste in a landfill is the primary method. Um, waste is buried underground essentially. Now it's not quite as simple as dig a hole and chuck it in. Uh, there is a procedure in place and there's these kind of five main areas that we need to discuss here. So the first is um, of a structure we this is all the, the garbage or the waste in here uh, but basically when we dig this hole we need to have a clay liner typically at the bottom and that's what's here okay so clay liner is number one uh, that what that does is it prevents um, the leachate which is the liquid that ends up you know developing as this decomposes and and moves through the ground uh, prevents that from getting into groundwater sources. So we need this this impermeable barrier here. It doesn't let anything through it. And then uh, we also need surface water collection ditches and that's going to prevent um, water from um, running down along the sides or running into our landfill. Um, basically taking storm water runoff and just preventing it from disturbing this in any way and just channeling it out in a way so it doesn't affect the, the landfill site. So that's number two is storm water or surface water runoff here. The, uh, the next thing we need is some leachate collection uh, pipes or typically perforated pipes and that allows us to, to get that leachate once the, the liquid kind of moves its way down through the landfill um, to kind of get that out of there and into pipes so that it can be removed from the landfill instead of just sitting there and um, accumulating. Uh, following that we have also, well this is our leachate collection, that's three. Uh, we also have our uh, fourth one here, Let me get those identified for you, and this is a methane gas collection. So methane is produced typically uh, inside as a product of decomposition. Uh, ultimately that methane is then building up in here, so having gas wells to either let it off gas or better yet collect the gas and use it for energy as really a beneficial thing of a, a landfill here. So we could burn that methane to make electricity, we could gather that and use that um, as, uh, as natural gas. So there's a lot of options here when we talk about um, using this, using our, our waste for some kind of benefit. 
Um, and that theme comes up time and time again here. So we want to be efficient with the waste that we use. Now, uh, the final thing is the cap. So this is number five, the five main things, uh, the cap, all right? So we want to cap it on top. This is, again, impermeable layer. So a lot of times the cap is plastic or uh, clay lined or both. Um, and then it, it really seals everything in here and allows the decomposition to occur. And, um, and finally, um, bury this up and seal off the entire site. Now, there are some things that, um, you know, we can't put in landfills. E-waste is one. Uh, for most things, it contain heavy metals, so things like electronics, computers, cell phones, those kind of things. Um, the heavy metals we don't want leaching into groundwater. Uh, they're not going to really decompose, so they're just going to sit there. So uh, recycling is a better method for anything that's in there that we can recycle. And then tires are another one, like they're an example of something that um, can also be recycled, uh, but ultimately uh, they can be breeding grounds for mosquitoes. They, they hold water, so like we don't want to just have them sitting in a pile. We want to burn them. You know, we can chip them up and uh, use them for other things. So uh, it's not necessary to put those in landfills. The next major method of disposal is incinerators. Now, this is a really Sounds like a simple process, just like a landfill, right? You want to just dig a hole and bury it. Incinerators, what do we do? We, did, we take this waste and burn it, right? So really, we burn it at high temperatures. Um, the nice thing about incinerators are we can use the heat. So in this picture here, you can see at this point, uh, number one right here, we can use this heat to heat water to create steam, turn a turbine, and make electricity. So there's kind of a, a double benefit here now. So we're burning all this garbage. We might as well get some energy out of it um, at the end of the day, right? Uh, this is referred to as waste to energy incineration. The great thing about this too is that it reduces the total volume. So rather than just burying it, we burn it down, and uh, all we have to do is then dispose of the ash in a landfill, which is good. Uh, the biggest problem is exactly what you'd think. We're burning something just like all of our energy that we had to burn or combust something. There was some air pollution involved. Um, acid rain is a byproduct. So, I mean, there's environmental downside for sure uh, for doing this. How do we reduce our municipal solid waste? Uh, recycling is a big one. We've heard about recycling since you're little kids probably. Uh, but ultimately, reducing demand for minerals, new minerals, if we can take what's in the old ones and reuse them somewhere else, um, reducing the amount of mining that's required, all that stuff is very beneficial. Uh, but it can be energy intensive and not always profitable, which is why some things aren't recycled. Um, just if it's not a profitable venture, it's, people won't do it. Uh, composting is another one. All your paper, food scraps, yard trimmings can be composted um, and, uh, and turned back into fertile soil, which is fantastic. So there's a lot of opportunity um, to, to prevent those things from ending up in landfills or at least reducing uh, the amount of food waste that that ends up there. Water. Now water, we talk about sewage and wastewater management. We're starting to get into a little bit different process here. Um, this is kind of a three-stage primary, secondary, tertiary process. And really what we're doing is um, when you, you know, flush the toilet, turn on the shower, and this water goes in the sewer, this is our wastewater. Now where does that go um, after it leaves the drain, right? <clears throat> it's going to end up in a wastewater treatment plant in this three-step process typically. Uh, this one is, is one here obviously for us. Um, we're looking at physical screening first. So our primary one is, is physical screening right here. So the physical screening in our primary step is going to involve uh, taking out the, uh, the big items that end up in, in the waterways. So screening out large objects. Um, things that don't uh, decompose um, over a period of time. So something like uh, like baby wipes that aren't supposed to be in there um, that get flushed can be screened out as well as any other solid objects. Um, other solid wastes like human waste settles down to the bottom of tanks um, and as sludge typically. Uh, so we see that in the primary clarification step here after the solids are removed. Now the secondary one is going to come up to the um, the biological screening. 
So what's happening here is that the tank is going to be aerated. So we add oxygen so the bacteria can start to grow. The solids continue to settle out as sludge down at the bottom. And um, the bacteria now start to grow in high numbers. And they're going to start breaking this down like they do as decomposers and digest uh, the solid objects and reduce the volume of sludge there. And the aeration and the oxygen just helps um, those populations to be sustained and continue to grow. So the sludge settles out. So primary is physical screening, big stuff. Secondary is biological. Tertiary is the last one. This is chemical. All right. So we're looking at tertiary screening. We're looking at chlorine and UV light as primary ones. Ozone as well can be used. And really what we're doing here is we're moving the water from the secondary to here. And then we're killing those bacteria that were in there so that we're not releasing them back out into this natural environment like Lake Michigan, for example. So once they've been treated and uh, the bacteria have been killed, we can then pump that water out back into a natural source like Lake Michigan as, as discharged effluent, essentially, is the term that we use. So then it's uh, water that's back out there that's able to be put back in and used again as a fresh water source. Our pollution management idea, we've been talking about pollution all units. Uh, this has come up a couple of times, is this replace, regulate, restore model. What I want you to see is that replace is about preservation. The idea of replacing um, a pollutant is this is preferred, right? Alter our human activity. So if we're talking about plastic bags that end up in the ocean, what's an example of replacement? Don't use a plastic bag. Use a cloth bag or use a, re a reusable bag so we have less uh, garbage uh, regulate. If we're not replacing something, then we need to regulate it. So examples of plastic bag bans, this is a little bit older of a uh, map here, but the idea that this is a mitigation step, like what do we do to reduce that impact and the, the release of the pollutant into the environment? Something like uh, passing laws, putting regulations, imposing fees or fines to motivate people to, to use that plastic bag less. Um, or whatever the pollutant is. And then finally, the last and least preferred option, long-term impact of pollutant in the ecosystem, is restoration, so the restore step. Remediation, restoration. Um, basically, cleaning up the pollutant after it's already been in the environment. This is the least preferred option because it's the hardest. Uh, it's very difficult to try to return an ecosystem back to its original state. And sometimes it's impossible, depending on what the pollutant is we're talking about. If we're talking about plastic pollution, then we have to gather all the plastic that ended up in the ocean and try to take it back out. It's easier to start here and take steps here and here than it would be for restore. For uh, legislation and pollution, this is all one big slide here. Uh, detailed notes um, for this will be required. As far as the AP criteria goes, uh, these are essential uh, legislation measures that have taken place that are... Um, are regulating pollutants. So we'll start with the Clean Water Act. Um, the Clean Water Act is basically uh, establishing the amount of, of discharge that's required or allowed in terms of pollutants that are being released um, by uh, like wastewater treatment or industry or that kind of thing. Uh, the, the CERCLA, the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, uh, created the Superfund sites, basically, to clean up abandoned hazardous waste sites. Um, there's a lot of these sites all over the United States, and uh, it creates this this available fund so that we can deal with these places where maybe private industry uh, failed to uh, deal with the waste that was there. The Safe Water or Safe Drinking Water Act uh, was established for. Um, what we're actually taking in, right, from our, our water treatment facilities and the idea that our drinking water has a, a set amount of standards that need to be considered um, what, for whatever we're being provided with as our available fresh water source. The RCRA, uh, Resource Conservation Recovery Act, uh, allowed the EPA authority over all hazardous waste, so the EPA kind of being uh, responsible from the monitoring the production of a hazardous waste to transportation to its final reclamation uh, or treatment. And then the Delaney Clause was the last thing to add in here. 
Uh, this required the FDA to ban cancer-causing food additives. So we talked about carcinogens. Um, the idea that uh, those might be in food is obviously very concerning. And so the FDA was an organization that was able to now look at what's in food and then begin to regulate anything that might be there that is carcinogenic or causing cancer.